Well, apparently, Walter has indeed been eaten by a shark and will not be with us this episode. Did somebody say a shark? It's a turtle, not a shark. I'm still here. Welcome to Through the Lens of the EMS Wizard Podcast. I am Mark Casey. I have Terry, John, and guess who? Who's back? Walter's back. Walter Walter had a meeting with a shark, but he didn't no, stick around for dinner. I had a meeting dinner. with a turtle. A meeting with a turtle. Meeting shark. with a turtle. But you were like, I'm not doing dinner. I got I got other stuff. The shark said, I, actually, he preferred fast food. He didn't want to hand out. Just for you, I did see two sharks, and neither one of them bit me. First of all, I'm not convinced this is Walter. We all know that this conspiracy that's happening out there in the Outer Banks area is getting out of control. Conspiracy uh, theorists. Yeah. Uh, Walter's not with us. He's Walter, on the grassy knoll. He, he was eaten. He was <laughs> eaten by a shark. I don't know who this imposter is, but, uh, you know, you look a lot better than the last guy. So uh, whatever the AI technology we're using to to insert Walter into the show, I'm not against. I like it so far. So, AC, I guess you did a good job AI me in here then. That's good. Good is, job, yeah. Mark. Good job. Good. Uh, rest in peace, Walter. Resident, re- the resident guest is back. We'll take it from here, King. <laughs> hey, did you uh, ridiculous people get anybody to uh, to talk with us tonight? Or are we just going to talk to AI Walter? That's not I... my job. My job is to be the resident guest. My job is not to bring people, is to be the resident guest. The guest can't bring guests. I don't think we had a, we have actually have like a special guest. I think we've more or less got a colleague. Oh, that's on this episode. To me, <laughs> no. Uh, Brad, we wish Brad, Brad Lawson, Mister, yeah, Mister Brad Lawson. Oh, him. Well, he's kind of one of us now, so I don't. That's what I say. He's probably a colleague. Probably a good place for him to introduce himself. Mm, Brad, I, can we Brad, call you Brady? If we're paying bills, you can call me Brady. <laughs> I don't mind sending you an invoice. <laughs> send you 10 invoices uh, I'd rather send you me a check <laughs> <laughs> I got you so yeah Brady, Brad, whatever I've been called a lot worse uh, this episode's just starting we will probably call you worse before it's over with <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about yourself not everybody out there you know everybody out there knows who we are except for AI Walter they're introducing. they're getting introduced to him now but they don't know you, so why don't you give us some background, and we're just going to rapid-fire you some questions about your viewpoints in today's EMS world. Sounds good, guys. I appreciate y'all having me on. So uh, I'm Brad Lawson. I'm from Robinson County, born and raised. So I uh, started my career in 1999. Uh, much like you guys have mentioned in the many talks that y'all have had, You know, I started out young. I was actually in high school when I started volunteering with my rescue squad. So we had the whole volunteer thing. You had to work your way up to be able to get on the local agency or whatnot. So I'm sort of cut from that same cloth. So in high school, I went to school and got my EMT, um, joined that local rescue squad in town and did that. I actually was running rescue instead of going to my senior prom. I was that tied up into the uh, volunteer rescue squad. I really didn't have a date, but, you know, so I ran rescue. So uh, fast forward a little bit, started working with an EMS agency and uh, worked my way right on into uh, the uh, supervisor world, all the way through to critical care, uh, community paramedicine. Then I found my way over into education, and I've sort of been in that area ever since. What type of uh, can you remember your very first promotional interview? Um, my very first promotional interview, yeah. Um, actually, I probably received a couple promotions without an interview. All right, um, you know, just sort of congratulations, you're the new field training officer, you know. Um, but uh, my first promotional interview would probably have been for a supervisor position working with an agency, uh, a very large private agency. Yeah. 
Well, how did that go? What did you What did you do to prepare, and uh, did it work? I was lost, man. To be honest with you, um, you know, it's it's one of those things. How do you prepare when you haven't been taught how to prepare? Hmm. You know, so uh, so it was. You're going in blind, and and so having that opportunity to do that. Fortunately, I didn't have a whole lot of competition, so so I was I was awarded the position. But uh, honestly, I had no idea what I was getting into. So, and, and that sort of ingrained in my head a little bit of things that down the road I now utilize when I'm teaching. And uh, that's why I'm so passionate about what you guys are doing with the leadership program as well. So when you get, so you got a job, you got the job as a, as a, that you was going for and you immediately went out there that started your two week boot camp that you went through so that you could be trained in how to do the job so that you could be effective at it. Right. Is that what you're telling me? No, 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 no not really. Not really. Um, it was basically a congratulations. You've got the position, uh, your next shift, you're in charge. Wow. That's uh, I don't think that happens in North Carolina. That must be an odd thing for you to have to go through right there uh, to be promoted to a position. They, they said that that all the knowledge you needed was contained in those gold bars. And then that white shirt that they gave you, it was, was enough for you. That's right. Just put on the shirt and everything else magically happens. Did you see that experience uh, continue through as as you continued your career? I mean, after the first one, there had to be others that you went through. And did you ever see it improve? Um, I, I, I wish I could say it did. Um, but that's one of the interesting things about my experience working between a local government agency and then working for a private agency and then working for a small private agency, and then even working for a hospital system, the styles are different and the supports are different. And so uh, it, I wish I could say it improved, but each of them had their own shortcomings, I would say. Well, I don't think that's any different than we see in North Carolina across the board, but it is interesting to hear a perspective of someone that had been in so many different a, a private local government and hospital base to say hey those are similarities lets us know further justifies that is an industrial issue that's out there um and that's why i think we all get out there and we get invested and we're passionate about what we do you know in our programs anyway um but uh you know speaking of programs you know we uh you you're the co-found founder of pierce as well uh give us a little background into that and we're probably going to jump all over the place here because uh, you you know you kind of you've kind of opened a lot of doors of perspective of you said large private you said hospital based you said local government I know Pierce is a thing I know you do stuff with us and then we haven't even talked about education yet and that's how you and I met so we we got a full plate man so just before we get too deep into it tell us a little bit about Pierce what they do because I think that's kind of cool okay so. Uh... One of my friends and I, uh, Andrew Malone, got together. Uh, he worked for me at a, a local institution teaching. And we noticed that we had a lot of people coming, fairly good drives to get some courses. And, and, and talking to these individuals, we realized that there was a desire for practical education, like we were doing things that they wanted. And instead of doing a class that's close to them, they preferred to drive the distance to get good hands-on quality education. And so we had the idea, well, instead of the students having to drive to us, why don't we make a product, a company to where we can take these practical courses to the people of North Carolina, the providers of North Carolina, and um, just assist other educational institutions and organizations on delivering quality education. That's sort of where Pierce ended up being born from. Is Pierce a guy? Is a Pierce a dude we know is Pierce behind you right now that telling you what to say? Yeah. No, uh, Pierce is a, actually an acronym. So oh. it's a practical, innovative, emergency response, consulting, and education. Mm -hmm. Oh, didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Yeah. So, that's what I do. AI, AI, Walter didn't know that. We didn't really upload his database very well. Hey, we're going to have to fix that. Y'all didn't, didn't pay for it. 
<laughs> you got a free version. <laughs> T.I.A. Terry is blurry right now. What's wrong with T.I.A. Terry? I don't know. It's, uh, it's looking for quality quality education, how to use this webcam. And apparently... Uh, it picks the most important things in your photo. Yeah. And right and now... It's the duck. duck. And it's the duck the is duck. very important. It's, it's a rubber ducky in a bathtub. It's kind of like... It's a, a homage. That's French for honor for Walter's three week vacation. The rubber ducky. Rather see the duck in the tub than T.I.A. Terry in a tub. I'll tell you that right now. Oh, there you go. That's what you say now. <laughs> it looks like y'all are sharing the tub. Who? The duck you and the her? duck. Yes. Don't ask. Thank don't God you me. and the duck. Mm. Yeah. Ah, so, Brad, tell us about your experiences with ducks in a tub. <laughs> So we were at this bar, and never mind. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> There's an edit. <laughs> That's a whole nother podcast. That's a whole yeah. nother, whole nother series. Buddy For five dollars a month, you can subscribe and get that version of the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> weird. Only podcasts. Weird. Oh me. Um. So, uh, educationally, um. You know, uh, what what drove you to want to do that? Now, you mentioned that you did your first promotion was a supervisor. So obviously it wasn't to be a program director or instructor somewhere. And at some point in time, you must have had something you liked about it. I don't know what that would be. Uh, probably need to do a drug test or something to figure that out. Why you would want to do something like that. But give us your background on it. Sure. So I really think I ended up in education through the passion of just wanting to do better as a provider. Um, starting out early in my career, I experienced a really difficult call where there were multiple fatalities. And uh, as an EMT, I was assigned to a patient just because it was an MCI st style accident. And uh, the only thing I could do was just give her oxygen and talk to her. You know, her two kids had been ejected from the vehicle. Uh, there were multiple other red tags, and she's pinned in her vehicle. And so uh, we're just having conversations, talking, and I watched this lady go from talking, being completely coherent to dead. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I said that I would do everything in my power to make sure that never happened again. I would learn everything I could learn, and I would be that provider who, if somebody needed to be there to do something, I would be that provider. And so that is what sort of drove me to be passionate about education, to be passionate about EMS in general. Um, I really thought I was going to be a career medic. I, I saw myself staying in EMS for 30 years. Um, the transition to education really came from, I felt like I could impact more by helping develop new providers then I could just do in that role as an FTO or that supervisor, so to speak, in the EMS system. So that's what ended up making my transition to the educational world was just me trying to touch as many patients and people that I can and just education ended up being that path. And what did you see when you got over there? I, I, I carry educate and Walter probably can have some follow-ups on this too, but um, me and Walter, we we see we saw the same things coming, you know, uh, transitioning from operations we'll call it to over to an education side. Um, what did you see? Did did you were you surprised by the the students that come in? Were you were you the support you received at the institution, the equipment? What what were some of the things that that really surprised you when you got over there, good or bad? <clears throat> um. I think that when I arrived into the educational world, there was still a lot of the, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, but those that can't teach, you ever heard that? <laughs> no, how's that go again? Those that can't teach. That uh, sounds, uh, sounds vaguely familiar. But... Vaguely familiar. Um, so, <laughs> so I wanted to make a difference there as, as well. Um, I, I didn't want to, to be the the educator that could not do the practical providing for patient care. Um, so, so there was sort of the shock of being in a place where maybe education 
was it as good as it needed to be to get people ready to be on the ambulance? It was like, let's get them to pass the test and don't worry about what they're able to do on a truck. They'll learn that when they get there. What was the driving force behind that? Did you feel pressure from like something else that that's what you were supposed to do in that role? Um, I felt like I could not be in that role that they were in. So I automatically felt like the outsider coming in, trying to change what their norm was, you know, in a, in a way. And, and, uh, and that, and that's hard. It's hard coming in and making a change when this is what we've always done and trying to say, what we've always done doesn't work, so we need to do something different. And so that can be difficult trying to come in and and uh, get folks to look at things differently and, and change methods of, uh, of what they're doing inside of an, an educational institution to deliver a better product to the industry. So that was tough, and, and it still is tough. Were you given an agenda when you took on an educational role of like, hey, we want these things done? Or was it very similar to your experience in, you know, local government of like, you know, here's the keys to the offices you log on. Let me know if you need anything. I mean, what was that like? Man, I, I think I got the course scheduled and outlined three days before my class began. And it was like, your room number is such and such. And I'll have your username and password when you get here. Go teach. <laughs> <laughs> so it it was a teaching role um, that you jumped right into. So you were doing a little bit of that. And did you have any coordination duties with that too? Like, did you have to build classes or anything hey, like that? Not, no. not at the time. At, at the yeah. time, it was uh, just just uh, teaching those initial courses, uh, some continuing education. But, you know, you know, back then when that started 15 years ago, there wasn't a whole lot of um, – utilizing what you do in, in, in your meetings and, and building your education based off of what, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of the words and it won't come to me now, but when we, when we have our meetings and go over the calls and we get our numbers based off of the peer review, there you go, peer review. Thank you. So, yeah. uh, utilizing peer review wasn't a thing then to determine what type of continuing education you needed. So it was really the cookie cutter, just, you're going to teach this, 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 this. So no real outline to go by or anything of that nature. So that's sort of how it all began. And through the years, it became a lot more formal. What do you think has been one of the biggest positive changes that have taken place on, we'll just keep it to education. If there was change that took place just in, you mentioned 15 years, what is a positive change that you've seen happen inside of the EMS education world that you've experienced? Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm sort of a fan of the co -ams. You know, there, there, it's, there's some good and there's some bad to it, but I think overall there's more good for standardization and uh, accountability of the program with the co accreditation. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of small details that, that come along with co-amps that can take away from some of the uh, classroom things um, when we're looking at a lot of the data that we have to do. But I really feel like co-amps has helped in its own way of, of more standardization for the institutions. Well, it certainly gives you uh, enough a roadmap. They give wow. you the thing, you know, something. So if you were to step in, said, you know, into a that type of role, um, you know, if you was just to go to Coamp site, you'll be able to see at least from a paramedic perspective what one should at least be building their courses like, how you measure them, what the outcome stuff is. So uh, I think that's the most significant change that has taken place uh, probably ever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's pretty, you know, to, to say statewide in order to do this level of education, you have to have, you know, uh, that recognition of, of the KHEP um, accreditation, you know, through co-amps. And, um, and, and it helped us all speak to the same uh, sheet of music, if you know, more than it did anything. 
similar to the American Heart Association, right? You know, um, when we say ACLS, we tend to just straight up think American Heart Association, but ACLS is Advanced Cardiac Life Support, and that doesn't necessarily have to be American Heart, but that's the that's the sheet of music people tend to go to when they when they see those things. Um, Walter, would 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 you agree with that? Would you say that that the Coamps is the in the fifteen years the 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 biggest change that you've seen? It's probably one of the biggest change that I have seen. Um, you know, it can be a hindrance sometimes, I think, but I think overall, you know, standardized education, and I can't just say stick because education still can be taught on your own. I think the standardized metrics of measuring education is there. So you can, you can still have your own unique, you know, there's five of us on here. We can each have our own educational way that we go with that, but we're still have to measure the same metrics. So I think that's the measuring of metrics is big. And, you know, the, the next big thing coming out is going to be AEMT accreditation. So right. we're talking about that within the next six months to a year, we're talking about AEMT accreditation, which is going to be a big world change for us as well. Um, since that has not been added before. Well, that's where OEMS was probably proactive in, you know, throwing that in there. Right. You know, the state was like, hey, in order to do AMT or paramedic, right. we see that it might be coming. We're just going to go ahead and say in order for you to do AMT, you have to have that accreditation. Terry. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I, I knew accreditation was coming for for the advanced or co-amps, but I didn't realize I was six to 12 months away. They've been yeah. talking about it for a while, actually. I mean, co yeah. have been it since as, as long as I've been even involved in it. And I go back, as, you know, 14 years dealing with this stuff. So people will be talking about stuff. I think January the 1st, I think it's released January the 1st, 25. Isn't that right, John? Latest, John, Brad? I think it's the latest release is supposed to be released. You know, putting out some stuff now, but January the 1st is the official release date of when you're going to be able to start applying and start working. Yeah. Could volunteers to begin with. Right. Like right. You, you can. Yeah. And so, yeah, right. you're right. Well, they're not making it mandatory at all. So right. it's not going right. to be mandatory at all. The office of yeah. EMS for North Carolina has mandated it, but the, the, the national level is not mandated. That's that, that was my point is like, it doesn't matter if, if co-amps makes anything mandated now, who right. EMS here has said, Hey, this is going to be right. a thing to do. So, it, it, it it's the shoot but to to that credit it, it does you still have that same roadmap so i feel like and i could be wrong but i feel like that um setting up aemt for an already accredited institution should be seamless you know because it ain't like you're having to create a new advisory board or hope. a new smc nah i mean i think i think they're all going to fall under the same thing you, it's just going to be another agenda item that you add is like give us your outcomes on you know your paramedic stuff and while you're at it give us the outcomes that you have on your amt and how those are with each other to that point also we um you know we talked about significant change or whatnot um you know that type the amt is the spotlight man that's the one that's like you know their their change in scope i think is pretty significant as well um but Go, that goes back to a little bit of what you were talking about, Brad, before you, you you said that word practical in your in your business name there, practical, because I'm assuming when you got in, you didn't feel like there was a lot of practical application being done. Did you get in, in the, dead in the, in the middle of online world where everything was kind of shifting? Yeah, I, and, and that's sort of what got us looking at this whole thing. Yeah, you had like all the online kind of had started. You know, now everybody's just, it's checking boxes. It's yep. not really anything of substance coming out of it. Um, and so we really, Andrew and I really wanted to have the ability to bring good content, not just to be able to say they've taken a class, but then actually be able to take away um, what they came for for the class, you know, um, we wanted them to have the experiences of being able to do the things that we talked about, not just hear us talk about it and look at it on a PowerPoint presentation. We wanted to actually put these skills into their hands and help them improve their abilities to function in the real world. 
So, and then that just sort of translated into what we were doing in the classroom. Um, so, you know, now you can go to our school and see we're probably outside more than we're inside, you know, so everybody's sort of bought in to that practical application of education. And so we'll start the day with students checking their bags and then they're outside all day long doing their education. But don't you think that was the intent of maybe simulation, uh, especially high fidelity simulation? So maybe we're just using different words, but to, to use the simulation part of that is to is to say, hey, we need a practical application to this. And, you know, um, you know we use those words high fidelity, but I don't know that they have a definition yet. Yeah. Um, as to what that means, because I I've said for years, you know, uh, you know that I don't need a billion dollar mannequin. You give me the billion dollar scenario and a Rosetta Annie, and I'll be all right. Yeah. Um, you know, and so um, I'll take that billion dollar scenario. But that's the practical application of it um, and simulation. So I think that is um, there's there's two things. Is one I think that's that definition of what that practical application is. It is a little bit simulated. Let me get it from my brain to my hands. Um, and then years ago, we were we talked. Uh, there was lots of talk. Uh, Might have been Walter and I just chit chatting. Like, wouldn't it be cool if there was a group of people that could just go around and do t sops? Um, and and we even talked. You know, kind of just some of that back patio stuff we do in Wilmington and Asheville. You know, uh, about if we just had a group that was from the East that could go and t sop the folks folks from Central, and Central could do West, and they could just all be that way. You're checking that box because in the old days, um, and I, Brad, you might have been a part of these old days. Did you have to go to this to get your six skills checked off at a community sure. college somewhere? Yes, sir. You look, you look that old. Mm. Um, and so, uh, it's baby the Mark, beard. <laughs> and baby Mark did not. Baby Mark didn't know nothing about that. <laughs> no, I didn't have to have any any skills checked off or anything at a different. I I asked Mark about a number two pencil, and he says he don't put doo doo on pencils. <laughs> okay what? we had to use those to do the scantron cards you know when you the bubble sheets and stuff so at any rate it wasn't uh, a number two pencil you were asking me about a chisel and a stone <laughs> just to be clear but <laughs> um but you know we had that idea of like why don't we why don't we have groups that go out and do t-sops it'd be very similar to groups that went out and did skills to do the testing that could go out front and help the, you know, the educational institution, whatever it may be, so that you're not testing your own to really to validate them. Um, and, you know, and um, but but I'll tell you what, when we was having these conversations, um, the silos were really a thing. They were really big and people did not want you crossing over into their yard. And I can say over the last I'll say two years, maybe longer than that. People don't mind folks being in the yard anymore. Um, I think silos are coming down, especially in the educational. Those that remain silo and guarded are don't realize that they're they're fledging programs. Their their programs are not as successful. They're just, um, you know, when, when they put their hands up and they're like, "I don't want any help and I don't need any input and I don't want to network." They're harming their whole program from that. I, you can just look around right now and see all of the fist bumps and hugs that go on from Murphy to Manio, you know, if you wanted to, and and say that's a that's a partnership. And that's one thing we've actually seen on this podcast is folks coming in, sharing their networking pieces of that. Would you agree with that, Brad? Yeah, and, and that's something I wanted to say is, you know, um, last year you actually gave me a call about an interest in a tactical program. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that got me to being able to go to other areas in the state and, and see things and able to compare that to what the norm has been for me for several years in the areas that I've been in the Southeast. And it does bring up in my mind a vast difference between what I'm used to seeing and what people in other parts of the state are doing. There is that whole Manio to Murphy and folks that are really passionate about education and passionate about their systems and their programs. And then there's other places that are really shut off and they don't want anything from you despite the efforts that you put into it. 
And uh, as an educator, that, that gets tough. And so it has been quite um, refreshing to be able to visit some of these areas that do embrace education and, and, and expanding and being a better professional and, and those things. So uh, that's something that's opened my eyes a lot this past year by being with you guys. Well, and, and, I, and I think you're able to spread that knowledge as well, because there are there are a lot of places where that that light doesn't always doesn't always shine and you've got to you've got to help people because they don't know they don't know what they don't know and and to to start to take this in a different direction as we co-amps gives you kind of that playbook for stuff and as leaders you might not as that agency person yeah you've you've got you've got your system plan stuff but you might not know all the other things until you start to until you start to to network so that that definitely starts to to play on with that just what, beyond what was something that, just beyond hold on Terry, but just beyond that playbook though i, I was going to add that those folks that still live in that world that the, they think that coamps is just a playbook when they get their site visit they'll see just how important networking really is because that site yeah. visit comes from two people not from north carolina coming in to pick your program apart and look at your evidence and stuff. And it's, it's really important that you've got somebody you can call and, 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 and know that. And you've seen the difference in those, anybody that's been through a site visit, which should be all programs eventually, uh, will you know, they'll see the benefits in having those things. So. So Brad, what, what would you say when, when you're doing, and, and I get it backwards, it's my, it's my TIA acting up when, when we talk about, uh, tactical EMS officer, you know, EMS officer tactics, tactical. What, what do you, what do you think is one of the big, the big lessons when you're, when you're doing that class and when you're talking with people, what's one of the big learning points you think with that? I think that when folks come to the tactical officer course, they leave with some of that and they now know some of the things that they didn't know or that they don't know. Um, <clears throat> there is a completely different mindset about austere environments and folks aren't adequately trained. And what we try to show them is you're not trained and here's how we can go about fixing that problem. Uh, folks have a tendency to think tactical we always start the class. How many people brought their tactical gear? Because this is always a bunch of people that's on tactical teams, da, 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 da. So then when we get, not to have a spoiler alert, but when we get to talking about the Aurora shooting, there wasn't a tactical team deployed. It's every freaking ambulance and fire truck that's available ends up having to go work this scene. And when you've never received any kind of training about working in an austere environment, it goes south real fast and people die because we're inadequately prepared for it. So the whole thought process behind the tactical officer one is understanding that we don't know how to operate in these environments. And then as we go to tactical officer two, this is how we develop our teams for our different agencies and how we will operate including street level ambulances all the way through to the special response teams that agencies may or may not have. So that's sort of where we start at with the tactical officer course, addressing those things. We don't know what we don't know. And we know we'll see that program grow. I think we are, we will put that off of the, the part two of that out very soon. I think in by the fall, would you say that's fair that by yeah. the fall we'll probably yeah. have that part two? Cause I know we got a lot of folks that listen are like, when's that come out? I get a lot of that on the contact form and the emails that I receive. Hey, that sounds like a good post-conference class for EMS at the OBX. Stand, <laughs> stand in line. See, sounds like a good post-conference for EMS at the OBX. Y'all need to, y'all need to restart AI Walter. He's just not, he's downloading from an iPhone, I'm thinking, and not a, an Android. And so that's probably he's, why he he's, he's on a dumpster phone. He's not. <laughs> you are the weakest link. Goodbye. Yeah, he's he's power cycling right now. Yeah. He's in a reboot process. He just, he just lost connection. 
That is you know, something being asked a lot. That, uh, is when is officer when is the technical officer two going to start? And so yeah, I, I think the fall would be safe to say that's when we're going to jump into that series because every time somebody sees me that's taking officer one, that's the question. It's not how are you doing, Brad? What are y'all doing? Technical? <laughs> Welcome, welcome to the club. Yeah, we want to know why they didn't get a patch for tactical officer one. Yeah, correct. Yeah, <laughs> why, why, why don't, why don't, why don't they get a patch, Brad? I think it's good plan? branding, and it's cool. Tactical officers, all or none, man. You, you either are or you ain't. So there's not a one and a two. You finish the series, <laughs> and you are. <laughs> well, uh, you've joined the club we're actually you're the most you're the one that looks the most like a wizard so we actually appreciate you be helping out and in, in <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we look forward to seeing you on the road the folks out there um we've already talked several times together already so some folks have already seen you i think it's uh yeah go ahead and mention it and i know you're going to terry what hey brad yes sir brad do you have a best friend He's already told you who his best friend is. He don't need to tell you again. I don't hear it again. For I posterity, he's sick. sick. <laughs> and it's Here's his best friend. Brad, don't fall for it. Just, just, just ignore it. Don't fall for it. Don't <laughs> fall for it. Don't get caught up in the trap uh, no. of you know assigning numbers. You know, I, I think that my last count was three thousand eight hundred and seventy-two. That's John. You're my, you're my eleventh best friend. Whoa, yeah, whoa, 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 yeah. whoa, whoa, Mark, whoa. Mark's climbed up. I mean, uh, now I'll tell you this. Most of those 3,000 people that are on my best friend list have been eaten by a shark. So by default, Mark is now up to ninth, I think. Ninth. Ninth. Yeah, ninth. ninth. I'm oh, just going to say oh. Mrs. Sheehy thinks that it's a sign that Walter and I have the same birthday. It, it just the sign. Just throwing that out there. What yeah. kind of sign? It's a good, a good sign. You know, Mark didn't say a whole lot in this, and I don't know why, and I do know why. He's not allowed to. Why? Thank you for joining us, Brad. I appreciate you guys having me. It's been a good time. <laughs>